If you're like me and on par with video game discourse daily, then you're perfectly aware of the discussions about lack of innovation and originality, the same series getting multiple games, remakes, remasters, so on and so forth. Immortals of Avium just so happens to meet the criteria of what people want from a game nowadays, a new AAA IP coming from a newly established studio compromising multiple talented people from across various studios they've worked previously, such as Sledgehammer Games, Telltale Games, Electronic Arts, among others. While every star signaled a potential home run with this title, the surrounding circumstances definitely weren't favorable for everyone involved, especially as this was their first title. First, the trailers didn't really make a strong impression as it was yet another fantasy game with a shooter component, myself included. The price tag being 70 bucks, which is a huge ask. And finally, the fact that the game was being published by EA, which, to be fair, they've been doing a great effort with their single player output, but the damage from the past is too much for people to get over it. So, now having finished Immortals in a 15 hour period, I can confidently say that the final result is a very messy game that tries to do everything, but can't actually nail most of the components it guns for. You see, most trailers painted this picture of the game being a linear first-person shooter with open-ended elements regarding player progression and exploration. But what the game doesn't fully explain, however, is that after some time, that notion is thrown out of the window and as you progress, it becomes this hodgepodge of various game systems that at first got me excited to see how it would evolve and push the game onwards. But by hour 9, it finally sank in that this concoction of ideas was severely underbaked and a lack of focus and restraint turned this potential sleeper hit into a shamble that doesn't know what it wants to be. Which is a shame, because underneath all the mediocrity, there's a solid shooter that falls victim to overambition. Immortals of Avium happens to be the first built-from-the-ground-up game commercially available to run on Unreal Engine 5, that's a mouthful. And it's kind of hard to notice if you ask me. I'm personally past that phase where graphical fidelity used to impress me, and now it's more of how you use that fidelity to make something unique, and in this game, the art direction is generally solid, but sometimes it can feel all over the place in later chapters, as the mix of high sci-fi with natural scenery sometimes clash and make the whole scenery almost feel forced in the density of the objects and the scale of the general architecture, but for the most part it does a great job of feeling natural, but technical performance however is another story. I played the game on PS5 all the way through, and the balance between cutting edge visuals and a rock solid 60fps is to be commended, especially for a next gen title as usually, one has to get for the other, but in terms of optimization it's really poor at the moment. I was constantly encountering performance issues like fluctuating frame rates during heavy combat encounters frequently and occasionally during general traversal. And I also happened to run into this rare bug at the start of chapter 7 where the audio disappears for a moment and then the screen froze. If you got captured. Sure, sure. It's just if I knew the whole plan it could be It happened once and I don't expect it to happen again or to anyone else. From what I've seen on the PC side, the story is also the same. Ridiculously big system requirements like a RTX 2080 for 1080p60 with a mix of low and medium settings as a minimum requirement and most people struggling to run the game at a solid frame rate on their rigs. And all of this ultimately puts into question if this should be the expected norm for future Unreal Engine 5 games moving forward or if this is just the lack of necessary optimization done in time from the developer side. But regardless, this situation really puts a damper into the initial impression people will have with this game. The general accessibility options are also really lacking for a game of this size and budget, and while there are some such as colorblind options for the type of game that it obviously is, others that address motor, auditorial or cognitive are nowhere to be found, and for me personally, a lack of a FOV slider and motion blur options almost ruined the experience for me due to how easily I am susceptible to motion sickness. But if it wasn't for the aim dot being constant on the center of the screen, I don't know if I would have made it honestly. While I have problems with the general game design and how some systems work and interact with each other, some bases that hold everything together are very solid, like the moment to moment game feel feeling spectacular, for example, as no action you perform feels awkward 
and coming from devs who have backgrounds in first-person shooter development, it just shows how polished the simple act of moving around the world feels. In addition, some small features not present would have been nice as they would have complemented well with general movement, like being able to vault over objects even after a double jump, to avoid that unnecessary awkwardness you'll face when you fail to reach an adequate height to cross over, which is not a biggie personally, but a suggestion nonetheless. These seem minor in the grand scheme of things, but when you start adding up the other elements present you kinda start taking them for granted. The level design structure for example is very odd. In its first hours it starts as a linear game, and you get the feeling this is how you're going to progress. But later on levels start opening up, something akin to the newer God of War games where here, it adopts the wide linear structure and often shuffles between linear levels and open areas with a metroidvania style twist where you can return to older areas with your new abilities. The weird thing here, however, is that it never really commits to the metroidvania moniker because, at its core, metroidvania level design is all about guided non-linearity, where the multiple paths present new areas that actively contribute to the story significantly the way I see it. God of War 2018 struggled with this, but in Ragnarok, their solution was to treat those new areas as side story content like the crater area for example, being all about fully immersing you in the universe and lore more than the main path already does, instead of being blockages that subtly guide you along the story path just like 2018 did with the black mist and the mountain. In Immortals, their approach is only for collectibles and new gear which, there's nothing wrong with it. But what ends up happening is that while it works as it should and it's all fine and dandy, nothing really stands out to motivate you to actually explore the levels, and even when the new gear is enticing, it can mean jack with how messy the general combat balancing feels which we'll touch on promptly. Metroidvania aside, the general pacing fluctuates a lot, and like I mentioned in the first few chapters the linear structure feels very well paced and ample enough for exploration but not too much where you get easily overwhelmed and start losing grip of what you need to do within them. But later on, the concept of pacing goes out of the window and from chapter 9 onwards, it becomes a mess. Levels can either stretch for too long with not enough variation to keep things fresh, combat encounters become constant to the point of boredom and repetition, sometimes for the sake of padding, or the chapter can just be a short thing that doesn't take more than 20 minutes, and when tallying up everything together, it feels very disjointed and inconsistent, and I don't blame anyone close to falling asleep as I had it happen for me from time to time. Platforming also doesn't feel good, and while it has nothing to do with the abilities themselves, I believe the main culprit is how the maths done to measure the distance and height of the main character's jump doesn't consider the environments themselves, and more often than not, you'll be dying in most of the platforming sections simply due to how inconsistent the system feels throughout your playthrough. The fundamentals of what makes the combat structure work are great and solid, and from what you may have seen so far, it does a good job of being entertaining and engaging for the most part. In its essence, you have three main modes of fire, blue magic that is the equivalent of a semi-auto rifle, red magic the equivalent of a shotgun, and green magic the equivalent of a machine gun with homing capabilities. And alongside it, you have supplementary abilities that add on top of the main three fire modes such as a lasso to pull or launch into enemies and general platforming, a laser beam to stun enemies, and a green slime ability to slow down enemies or particular objects highlighted in green. There's also a shield and four quick abilities in the same vein as the main three magic types, which are more useful to break down their shields. On top of this, there's also a gear system where you can upgrade your equipment as the game goes on and an upgrade system for your abilities, and it's thankfully not as needlessly complex or jarring as it may look. The one thing that sucks about both is that they are percentage based, so you're just adding incremental buffs to the toolset you already have, and instead of having unique abilities or elements that would have made the system great to engage with, you only gotta worry about crafting items that give you like a uh, little boost in armor or damage points or upgrading your magic to deal like 10% more damage. And even when there's some depth present here, it's generally shallow in the grand scheme of things. Certain sigils give you some sort of flexibility that makes them fun to play around with and it can enable some build-esque playstyles to be had like swapping an 18 bullet green sigil to an 80 bullet sigil with an insane fire rate or swapping a red sigil from 3 bullets to a single bullet that does an absurd amount of damage. 
It gives it a sort of variety that is fun to play around with for the most part. The biggest detractor from all of this centers on enemy variety and how often that plays in combat encounters and how the general balancing is all over the place. Enemy variety comes through color coding and while you're able to inflict damage with different types of magic, matching the same color as the enemy deals the adequate amount of damage that you would expect. This is similar to what DMC Devil May Cry did before the rebalancing in the next gen releases. And while it's not as egregious as not being able to damage enemies with a different colored weapon, it still becomes very messy with the number of abilities you're given, how crowded your controller feels as a result, and how you ultimately struggle to juggle everything during intense combat encounters. Add insult to injury and the general balancing is also ridiculous, as the more you progress, you start dealing with really spongy enemies, even when you have an upgraded arsenal, and their difficulty level does not scale proportionally per chapter, that it just happens to fluctuate in which region you're present in, and it slowly becomes a slog to interact with. And by chapter 9, I was so done with the combat model that, instead of experimenting as I was, I just brute forced my way through. The game also goes on for too long, and this is due to the combat encounters shuffling you through recycled enemies with large amounts of health to make you waste your time. My breaking point was in chapter 17, where a specific enemy type known as an Archon suddenly had his model scaled up his health ridiculously increased for the sake of him being a boss, and the only efficient way to defeat him was by gathering a power up that powers up your ultimate ability, which also does jack of damage and I was honestly ready to give up, but didn't because I was already nearing the end. It's very hard to take the story seriously, because in an attempt to tell a very ambitious story in terms of skill and scope, everything is marred down by the simple fact that its humor is its largest detractor. And I have nothing against humor when it's well balanced and complements well with the tone of the story and is used appropriately. But here they took an approach similar to the MCU and the narrative struggles to find a balance between seriousness and goofiness. The amount of lore on offer starts really strong and gets your attention pretty quickly the more you read the descriptions or pay attention to the world around you and I was making a commitment to keep up with it and figure out how stuff connects with each other but the tone of the story later just made me not interact with it. There is, however, one saving grace that really saved the whole thing for me, which are the cast of characters that are really strong and way more interesting than the main character and at, a, and at one point, I was just playing the game just to see them interact with each other. Jack as a main protagonist is a mixed bag. On one side, he shows significant emotional intelligence to thread into situations with sense and react to them accordingly, just like a normal human being. But at the same time, he spends most of his time quipping and yapping constantly, even in serious moments like a cartoon character. And it feels very dissonant from what's happening in the story. The last time I talked with Sandrak, he pulled the same you wouldn't exist without me lecture you are. So you're a little late to the party, sir. You will go back to the Shrine Forge and get the mark you were ordered to in the first place. Can't do it. And then you will come back here and destroy this thing. Oh. No, I'm, I'm being for real. I, I can't. The machine, it, well, it, it broke. Don't fuck with me, Jack. I really wouldn't mind this if the frequency was kept to a minimum, but this is what you'd call Joss Whedon writing, which is such a shame as I struggle to truly connect with him, especially when the performances of the rest of the cast are very strong, specifically Gina Torres or Kirken, where I was always enamored when she was on screen and how she would present herself in most circumstances like a commander and not a Looney Tunes character. Anyone that stood up needs to stay that way. Their next wave is moving in and we've got positions that need bodies. The Rasharnians capture this ley line. We can all lie back down, permanently. At this point, I'm so exhausted from this game that instead of writing more sentences, I'll just give you a few overarching key points of how my experience shifted throughout my playthrough to save time for both of us. Chapter 9 was the lowest point in the game for me, not only does it drag, but the payoff doesn't feel that good, especially when they introduce enemies you can kill, and the interactions you have with Rook, one of the characters introduced in this chapter, just soured the entire effort I went through to meet a character I was supposed to find, as is the most annoying character that tries too hard to be cynical, not in a good way, and both the actor and the writing can save him for me. The game is simply too long and is trying to do too much for its own good. 
I would have much preferred if this was a tightly paced 8 to 10 hour game instead of a God of War light first person shooter that goes from, from 15 to 20 hours on average. And I feel the main culprit is that it falls victim to adding too much content to justify the price point and it ends up becoming a jack of all trade but master of none. For a first game the quality is strong and the passion is visible but it should have been directed by someone who actually knows when to put pump the brakes and just say no. And it also doesn't help when the marketing did a poor job into fully explaining how this isn't simply a linear game as it's quite expensive. While I was mostly negative in this review, I do hope it doesn't negatively affect Ascendant Studio significantly because the blueprint is very strong and I'm sure they can nail a hit in the future. They just have to hone in on their abilities, position a director who knows how to best position the team to work within their scope and nail whatever they do next and make sure people are aware of what it is in the clearest way possible. And that's all I have to say really, not much to add anymore. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe, share with your friends and activate the bell so you can get notification of my latest video and thank you for watching.